So, Ling Ling, who are your favorite Chinese bureaucrats? Well, I, I wouldn't say any of them are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, do I have a choice? Do I have a choice? Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, oftentimes, I feel like I'm stuck with writing these people. Um, <laughs> I often tell Bob, I really envy you because they are so colorful, right? They, they say things like, you know, off the cuff jokes and comments, however wacky it might sound, but, but they're human beings. Right? Yeah. They're, they're just human yeah. beings. Not so, in a million years is a Chinese source going to tell you, oh yeah, we're having fuck America week. <laughs> exactly. Well, hello and welcome to China Talk. This week, Ling Ling Wei and Bog Davis, both longtime Wall Street Journal veterans, talk about their recent book, Superpower Showdown, an epic TikTok of the U.S.-China trade war. Ling Ling, mind starting us off with a little bit of personal history? I was born and grew up in China. I was born in the late 70s into a military family. Both my parents have served in the Chinese the PR, P, PLA for most of their lives. My mom was a medical doctor, uh, officer, and my dad also served in the army until Deng Xiaoping decided to downsize the army. So, you know, I grew up in a family where both my parents, you know, had, they folks really focused on disciplines and academic achievements and all that. In, the, in my family, as, as soon as I could really remember things, I remembered how proud all my family members always are in terms of my grandfather's connection to Chairman Mao. You know, he basically was with Mao Zedong during the entire long march. And, uh, you know, it was sort of like, to my family, you know, he was among the people who helped, helped build a new China. So anyway, so, you know, I is, you know, I am among the people, uh, the younger generation in China that benefited tremendously from China's reform and opening up. So back in 1999, I got a full scholarship from New York University to basically study journalism at NYU. And I was super excited and everything. And uh, in May of that year, there was this U.S. bombing of Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And certainly that was a huge event um, in this U.S.-China relationship and caused quite anti-American protests in China. And, you know, I remember just day in and day out, the state media, you know, would, you know, play over and over again, you know, those uh, pieces, you know, calling out the American hegemon, you know, just were very, very intense. And obviously, as we wrote in the book, there were lots of suspicion, both in the U.S. too and, and, and China. It, was that really an accident or that was intentional, right? So nobody in China believed it was really an accident. So, and, and I, you know, I also started to doubt is it really, should I still go and go to America when is when is bombers actually, you know, bombed our embassy and killed the Chinese people? So I, I really questioned myself and I went to this editor who's a really a good mentor and friend. So I, I asked him, so should I go? Should I still go take the full scholarship and go? Because my interview at the U.S. Uh, consulate in Shanghai was literally the next day. So, and then he said, just go. <laughs> just, that's the only thing that, just, just go. Just, you know, he, he, he said, you know, just, he didn't say anything else. He just said, just go. It's your future, just go. That's what I really remembered. So after enrolling at NYU, you start a career at the Wall Street Journal, worked there for um, a number of years, got transferred to the Beijing office, and are now, unfortunately, you know, have been remanded back to the U.S. So what do you think the, the implications for U.S. coverage are now that some of the um, most longest serving, deeply sourced folks working for major American outlets can no longer go to the mainland? Sure, it certainly is very unfortunate that so many really experienced American journalists have been kicked out. I really think it's, um, it's a loss for China, not in China's interest at all, because now more than ever, 
the Chinese should have a lot of reasons to get the outside world to understand what really is going on there much better. We need more windows open, not fewer. And、um, so this kind of tit for tat exposure to journalists just really is meaningless.、It's, you know, this I, I just don't feel like it's in the either country's interest. So throughout this book, politicians from the U.S. and China have constantly referred to the relationship as some twisted marriage. I particularly was drawn to the most off-color reference by Lo Jiwei, a former finance minister, who said that in the '80s, with regards to trade policy, America treated Japan like a mistress. But now, to the U.S., China is more like a wife who is more entitled to fight back against a bullying spouse. This sentiment is certainly not 2020 appropriate, but I'm curious if you guys have any potential Chinese or American celebrity marriages that you think capture the essence of the U.S.-China relationship. Well, for me, one comparison—I mean, the former,、uh, not former, the current Politburo, Politburo Standing Committee member Wang Yang made was to the marriage between Robert Rupert Murdoch and Wendy Deng. Right, that was in our book. They talked about that basically, just the, how that marriage fell apart. But then he basically made a comment that you know, when it comes to the U.S.-China marriage, is not going to, they're not going to get divorced because it's just way too expensive, even more expensive than the other marriage, the real life marriage, and turning into divorce. So that's the one. You know,、uh, reference the top, one of the top Chinese leaders made. Sure. So, you know, of all the people to be hanging out with the world, the Trump White House and the Xi administration do not particularly sound like the most fun folks. So, I want to I want to congratulate you guys on this yeoman's work of developing these the sources and 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 sharing this narrative for for everyone. But I'm curious if you maybe could share、uh, a few character sketches of the folks who you felt had the most out. Outstanding personalities. So, of all the people to be hanging out with in the world, the Trump White House and C administration do not particularly sound like the most fun folks to be spending a lot of time with. So, I first off just want to congratulate you guys, Oman's work of developing these sources and sharing this narrative. I'm curious though if you guys could share a few character sketches of the folks you think had the most outstanding personalities in this cohort. On the American side, I mean, it is it's quite a cast of characters. I mean, the one who. Almost no one likes is Peter Navarro, the trade advisor, a guy who was an academic in、uh, California. Had、uh, you know, it was a reputable academic, was a Harvard PhD. He was an expert in、uh, utility regulation. Turned himself into a China, not a China scholar. I would, I would kind of call him a China pamphleteer. You know, he looked at pretty much everything, every bad thing you can possibly think about China. Many of them, which are are true, and then put them into package them into any number of books with names like the, you know, Death from China, the Coming China did, Wars. Did he、yeah. insult dumplings at some point? Insult dumplings? How could anyone See, insult dumplings? There was some dumplings? Like food about like <laughs> spicy food was bad. I don't even know. It's not even worth it. Never mind. <laughs> he might have. Who knows with him? But <laughs> but I mean, you know, he was sort of in in some ways he was a kind of Washington character. Yeah. In the in you know at his heart, I mean, he was sort of an academic on the make. He tried to get elected, ran for mayor, ran for Congress on Democratic Party, Republican Party, came close. He actually came close a couple of times, and and was had a reputation as an anti-urban development environmentalist of all things. But then he morphed into this you know conservative, anti-China personality, and the the Trump team, which had no. Academic support, you know, grabbed onto him. He was a PhD academic, after all, a PhD economist from Harvard, no less. So he gets into the White House,、um, and then he is immediately frozen out by people who you feel will be far, far more effective in dealing with the president than he would be. People like Gary Cohn, who was the president of Goldman Sachs, Steve Mnuchin, who was another, you know, very senior person at Goldman Sachs. People who had spent their lives. Figuring out how to climb bureaucracies and had done it well, and were powerful personalities. There was one time where Navarro, being frozen out from the White House for from the Oval Office for 50 days, you know, wanders through the old Executive Office Building where he has his office, which is across from the White House, saying, "You know, it's like fucking Game of Thrones around here." 
and you just could feel I felt I felt bad for the guy actually. I mean I I thought he was pugnacious, you know, you know, swimming against the tide. What forget about sort of the policies and all that. But then, you know, over time Trump relies on him more and more not so much for policy support because he really didn't have that kind of sway, but more for almost moral support. I mean for, you know, I want to take a tough stand on China and Peter Navarro is the guy I'm going to go to. Now, that contrasts with another one who's very hawkish on China, the trade representative, Bob Lighthizer, who, when he first met Trump, Trump looked at him. He's just, you know, a trade lawyer, very stiff, uh, didn't like the guy, couldn't remember his name, whether it was Lighthizer or Lightheimer or whatever. But he was a guy, Lighthizer was a guy who was an avowed protectionist. That's uh, what he uh, had written op-eds about it, including one supporting Trump during an earlier presidential run. The two didn't know each other. And he was kind of the perfect trade representative for a guy like Donald Trump because he he was a protectionist. He had he did have China in his sights his whole career, but he understood how to use the levers of government. He understood the law. He understood, you know, uh, acting within the law, taking doing the procedural, making the procedural steps or taking the procedural steps you needed to to win lawsuits. And if you kind of um, compare the administration on trade to the administration on immigration, two of its biggest priorities. I mean, they got reversed time after time after time on immigration, and they've never been reversed, never been reversed on trade. So what you had was uh, Navarro as kind of, you know, the emotion, the id, I suppose, and then uh, Lighthizer as the one who actually the effective one who could get to Trump and convince him to take the steps that that both of them wanted him to take. So Ling Ling, who are your favorite Chinese bureaucrats? Well, I, I wouldn't say any of them are my favorite. <laughs> uh, I just, do I have a choice? I have a choice. Um, I'm like, I feel like oftentimes I feel like I'm stuck with writing these people. Um, but I often tell Bob, I really envy you because they are so colorful, right? They, they say things like, you know, off the cuff jokes and comments and just, wow, that just, yes, how, however wacky it might sound, but, but yeah. they're human beings, yeah. right? Yeah. They're, they're not, just human yeah. beings. Not so, in a million years is a Chinese source going to tell you, oh yeah, we're having fuck America week. <laughs> That's true. Exactly. Well, well exactly. what about Ling Ling? What about Lo Ji Wei? He's, he's like a piece of work, kind of. He's a piece of work. So when I heard about that marriage, uh, the wife versus mistress, that, that, that comment, uh, Jordan, you referred to earlier, I was like, oh my God, we have to write about this. It in itself is a great story to show at least, you know, some Chinese official still, you know, can, you know, however politically incorrect that might be, still, you know, speaks his mind, right? Not always towing the party line. But anyway, obviously, from for the Chinese side, just really try, I really try to, you know, focus on the very top, because as you know, that Xi Jinping has considered so much power, he's the one who caused a shot. So we really spent most of the uh, emphasis on him and also on Liu He. He's basically right-hand man when it comes to economic matters. So we, we really try to explain what kind of person he is and how his years of experiences, you know, in, all, all the way back to his childhood, you know, he's uh, spending years uh, in a village feeding pigs and doing other kind of manual labor. You know, how all those experiences have shaped him you know, both as a person and as a as a leader. You know, he never ever really, you know, drifted away from being a loyal party member, right? He ne- didn't see the contradiction between, you know, continued liberalization and consolidating power, emphasizing party control, because he thinks that, you know, there's there's no contradiction there. His predecessors have done that and he thinks he can do that as well. In terms of Liu He, you know, obviously uh, he's a very well-liked figure, uh, both in China and overseas, especially in the U.S. People in the U.S. feel like he, you know, he speaks very good English, you know, uh, very humble, modest, hardworking, professional, all those good qualities. Um, I mean, a lot of Americans are looking forward to. But on the other hand, you know, he's nothing like 
Zhu Rongji, right? He doesn't have the political chops or political、uh, bureaucratic cunning to really push through really painful changes that the Chinese economy badly needs, or the U.S. you know side has been demanding all along. So we we just really try to on the Chinese side the most of the emphasis in terms of characters, personalities. We really try to focus is true, and obviously we talk a little bit about. You know what kind of pers- people you know worked for Liu He. You know part of his team is this guy Liao Ming, right? He's also very more, one of the more、uh, Westernized officials in China, and also it,、uh, unlike any of the、uh, bureaucrats、uh, that you. You know, we commonly know. You know, he actually has some kind of personality, and you know, he's quite a character. He likes to write song,、uh, songs, and actually, is quite a good singer. So when he was named as, you know, a key member to Liu He's negotiation team, you know, the online community in China called him the folk folk song singer. So it. It's、just you know, we try to just here and here and there, just try to give a fuller picture of what the Chinese team is like. But of course, the most emphasis is on Xi and Liu. You know, what's interesting, Ling Ling, is like actually these guys' personal histories are much more interesting than the than the Trump team. I mean, the 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 psychodrama of you know your parents getting purged, and you know we were talking about Liao Min. He was on. Peking University campus from 1986 to 1993, and I, I can't imagine like folk singers. Folk singers were like the big right wing clique on campus, and、no. and so whatever is going on in these in these folks' heads to lead them to the positions they are today is like the, these memoirs will never be written in a way that will you know satisfy our curiosities, but just just sort of、um, hypothesizing about what all those seeing all this trauma over the over the preceding decades does for does for these these. These leaders now is a is an interesting thing to ponder. Yeah, sure, it's fascinating, endlessly fascinating. And、sure. as, you, as you point out, I hadn't really thought about this. If he was on campus in those years, it would have been during his、Tiananmen. friends died. His friends were killed yeah. completely. Yeah. You know, it's 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 the the history is very real with 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 this entire generation of of leadership in a way that it is completely not to anyone but what was it? Hank Paulson got the shout out. For 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 having stormed the beaches of Normandy, but basically、uh, Hank Greenberg, Hank Greenberg, Hank Greenberg, Hank Greenberg. Yes, Hank、yeah. Greenberg. I always think that there is a psychological reckoning that will come at some point in China for all the sort of horrible things that you know generations went through. I mean, to me, it's like you know not all that different from people who had gone through the Holocaust and survived, right? I mean, they were closed up about it for years and years and years, and at some point it comes out. I mean, like you know, like Ling Ling's family is just to me the story of modern China. I mean, they've been through the Cultural Revolution, they've been through the the great the great leap forward. I mean, and and her family isn't unusual remotely, right? I mean, they've all been through it. It's just within a two generation,、yeah. you know, time span. Just these amazingly, you know, traumatic events. Yeah, it's 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 important to remember every single one of these characters who lived through the '60s went hungry,、um, and、yeah. it's sort of it's it's sort of hard to, you know, like like no one in the Trump White House has had any. Personal challenge of of that that pale you know nothing that that remotely pales to what the, the 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 Chinese side has gone through over the course of their lives and you know the the values that they've、um, you know imbued from their parents who've、um, seen even more and have been even more directly infected by the、uh, the tribulations of the Mao years. Right, and that's the one thing. If you talk to Chinese officials, they would often remind you of. Like the Chinese Chinese people and the you know this leader or their leaders have been through so much. It's like you know nothing we haven't experienced before. When、yeah. when they talk about current situation, they said, "Okay, so be it. If you know, if you really, I mean, at least that's an official line. If you you really you know cut the ties completely and and crack down China completely, you know, we can just you know fasten our seatbelt or you know tighten our purse strings. You know, eat bitterness. So we're very good at eating bitterness. But obviously, the reality today in today's China is fundamentally different from that era. You do have. Have a hugely、uh, changing population, their needs and their 
demands have also changed uh, dramatically. You just can't draw that simple comparison anymore. Sure. So let's talk about Xi's economic ideology. You know, at one point, I remember I was working at Eurasia Group, and everyone, all the China analysts, got excited when he said that the market should play a decisive role. But it has been a long so time we. since then. <laughs> So, you know, there, there is a level at which he appreciates markets, but is, there is a deeper level at which he appreciates state-owned enterprises. Talk a little bit about how his past experiences in, in Shanghai and Fujian inform this view and how, how his thought with regards to the role markets should play in China's economy has uh, played out over the course of his time in leadership. Sure. Upon rising to power in late 20. 20- 12, Xi Jinping's plan basically was really at the, that point he was to continue Deng Xiaoping's policy and advance it basically because under Deng Xiaoping and the and the, the leaders after him, you know, China did liberalize uh, the economy um, step by step, and for Xi it was a natural continuation of that policy. So during that you know the I think was in 2013, you know when they issued that big economic blueprint, the wording tra- had changed from market forces play playing a role, in, an important role, to a decisive role. So they they just really thought that was a continuation of Deng's policy, but. You know, he's obviously, uh, she's early experience of running uh, some of the uh, wealthiest regions in China, including Fujian, Zhejiang, Shanghai, you know, helped shape his views, you know, help him gain certain kind of respect for market forces. So that definitely played a big part into why, uh, you know, the, the, the way he phrased the term at, at, at the time. But obviously for him, the top priority is maintain stability and uh, strengthening the party's rule of China. So when that effort to expand market influence in China's economy kind of runs counter to the top overarching agenda of strengthening parties' control over the country, when those two things contradict, obviously he would pick the latter. And and the, the the market crashes in 2015 and in early 2016 really uh, spooked him. So that was a really a period of time when he thought, okay, you know, market was was dangerous, was very ris- risky, and it was a time when the state actually helped rescue the investors and the like. So that really was a turning point uh, in how he views the market uh, forces and you know how why why there was such a 180 degree turn later on you know in terms of reforms this show took me 10 hours of reading two hours of script writing an hour of recording and four hours of editing to produce right now i receive 50 dollars in donations per show meaning my work on this podcast averages out to making three dollars an hour as much as I love making China talk, I'm coming up on the 100th episode and I've been reflecting on how much time I put into the podcast and it's getting harder for me to justify spending so much time on something that brings in so little financially. If you have the means, please consider supporting the show. Links are in the show notes. Let's talk a little bit about Xi's relationship to America and how it's evolved over time. Right. I, you know, she definitely, I mean, about, uh, I don't know what's happening now, but up until recently, I mean, up until we finished the book, we definitely could have said uh, definitively he, he returned certain, you know, the respect and affection for, for the Americans. He named his chief agenda for China, China Dream. Right, sure. that ring of American dream, and he when he met with I think it was President Obama during their last summit together, he said she said that there are thousand reasons to have a good U.S. China relationship, not a single reason to spoil it. And that's the line he has repeated over and over again, even with President Trump. So, so obviously he did set out to try to have a good relationship with with the U.S. But obviously. In the end, it's the actions that speak louder. The fact that the China has become increasingly assertive and aggressive on all those issues certainly, you know, made the U.S. more alert of the wary of, of China's rights. So, 
she made a speech at Davos, which I think is a fascinating kind of moment of political theater, um, where he tries to sort of take upon the mantle of globalization, you know, very much in contrast to the line that the Trump administration was was staking out. Paint a scene a little bit about what this speech was and what it and what it represented at the time. So, you know, this is the beginning of the Trump administration, right? Trump had, had campaigned on uh, America First, talking about an isolationist, protectionist administration. He delivered a lot on that kind of talk. And so for Xi Jinping, this was a moment where he goes to Davos. So you, you go in there, and for Xi Jinping, this is a great opportunity to talk about his devotion to globalization and to the power of global interchange and global trade. And he gets a standing ovation because he's seen as you know, someone standing up for global, global integration, which uh, everyone in Davos agrees with, and he's not Donald Trump. I, I remember, you know, his speech actually was quite, it, it was a good speech, I have to say, that, you know, in, it was unlike a lot of, unlike reading the, the official documents coming out of China, all those really formulae kind of remarks by Chinese officials is carried by the state-owned media. That speech was, was, was quite effective. And, it, you know, I remember he even quoted Lincoln's Gettysburg speech. So in that speech, so obviously they really tried hard to get his message across to a more global and elite audience. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I have a hypothesis that they found some PR person, or maybe there's just like some young person who spent a lot of time in the West who's who's who was involved with this. But it it oh, very much of people. They're full of people. No, no. Yeah. Totally. But yeah. It, 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 it was the one time where he really sounded like he was a Western politician giving a speech, which is not what 99% of the, you know, the internal party speeches or whatever um, that end up getting posted later sound like. As you mentioned, the at one point, he kind of needled the U.S. about how development should be of the people, by the people. And for exactly. The people. Exactly. Um, it, it's funny because the Americans do this, too. You know, they have someone who, who took their who took their early Chinese classical thought courses and you know Lighthizer had like some you know Confucius reference Ponder quotes Lu Xun every once in a while oh my um, gosh yeah here's a question for you two guys who do you think has more respect for their supposed intellectual grandfathers the Trump administration towards Lincoln or she towards Kongza the Trump administration has no intellectual roots to Lincoln <laughs> let's just end it right there I, I would agree with Bob, <laughs> but, you know, in China, definitely, I, I think, you know, on the surface, of, of course, there's an effort to really, you know, get a uh, younger generation to know more about the Chinese culture, the traditional Chinese culture. You know, this stage, I, I, you know, when I lived in Beijing, I saw so many of my friends actually hi hiring like uh, traditional Chinese tutors for their children. So it's, it's, it's definitely, you, you, you sense that happening. But at the same time, you know, Xi's rule of China has been marked by this remarkable uh, renewed emphasis on making the party the center of every aspect of the Chinese society, which, you know, includes the Chinese, you know, education, the, the, the you know, the, the cultural aspect, aspect of things. So, yeah, you know, they often talk about about the need to respect the traditions and all that. But, you know, the caveat always has been, you know, of course, we learn about the, what the past was based on what the party's interpretation is. It, it's funny, Ling Ling, because I, I, I walked by a lot of those little, like, classical schools for yeah. children that have that, you know, they have, like, the nice, like, ancient-looking like. doorways. And I walked into one or two of them, and I was like, hey, like, can you guys teach me? And they just were so confused that, like, a 29-year-old white man was <laughs> wanting to hang out with 10-year-olds and <laughs> recite Confucius and <laughs> learn how to paint classical, you know, landscapes or whatever that they all, they all very polite me politely turned me away well anyways uh one of the tactics of the of of xi's administration is to have these sort of old friend sessions where senior chinese officials will have conversations with folks who've been doing business for a long time in china and you know 
try to work them, basically. Describe the relationship between the senior Chinese officials and the leading lights of business and, you know, former, former administration officials they keep in touch with. Right. So you mentioned those old friend sessions Wang Qishan frequently has with American business leaders that he had known for years. He, you know, he doesn't have a specific portfolio for now, but he's influential with President Xi Jinping because, you know, they go way back. He's also instrumental in terms of helping Xi launch this uh, unprecedented anti-corruption campaign. So he definitely has the ears uh, of, of, of Xi Jinping. So he sees himself as an advisor to him. So through those old, uh, session, old, old friend sessions, you know, he tried to, you know, get more understanding, better understanding, more information about the Trump administration. So, and then pass along to the top leadership and help them formula, uh, uh, form uh, is basically for foreign policy American, you know, how to deal with, with the American side. It's interesting, the uh, relationship of uh, big business and some of the more famous uh, CEOs and their ability to influence this administration. So on plenty of things, on tax policy, on deregulation, big business has an enormous role in this administration. I mean, it is an administration that has appointed lobbyists to head cabinet agencies. But on trade, it's very different. Trade is an area where Donald Trump, from the start, knew his own, knew his own head, wasn't really interested in talking very much on trade policy to, to these same people. Um, he would listen to them when it came to you know, how the market was doing, which he cared about enormously. But I, w- I would say, you know, for people like Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone or John Thornton, who used to be a Goldman Sachs, or the, some of the uh, casino owners, Sheldon Adelson, and people of that sort who have lots of contacts in Beijing, they would largely operate as kind of messengers. You know, they would get in- intelligence from the one and so on of the world or Lu Hu's of the world and relay it back to Washington. They would take messages from Washington and relay it to to China. They tried to keep things from spinning out of control too badly, but their influence in terms of getting the administration to change course on the fundamentals, on using tariffs as a as a weapon, as pushing China further and further, it was actually quite limited. Could you talk about the dichotomy you lay out as Trump as both hawk and dove, as well as blue collar Trump versus Wall Street Trump? Trump is, you know, is, an, is, a, is a more complicated character than he sometimes looks. So he's a guy who basically made his reputation as more than a trade, de- as more than a real estate developer by, by, you know, working on or talking about international trade. I mean, if, at, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was, it was Japan. They're ripping us off. You're, you know, the leaders are playing you for fools. It's exactly the same arguments he would make about China. But, you know, repeating the same thing for 30 years gives you a certain sense of uh, that you know what you're talking about. And then, so he comes in, he comes into office talking enormously about China. China's one of the big planks. Again, the same pitch that, you know, uh, it's an anti-elitist pitch. The Chinese have ripped you off and your leaders have let you down. And that was one of the fairness, you know, basically a symbolism of fairness and, and elitism that, that the campaign capitalized on. So he comes in and he really isn't ready uh, to take on China, not remotely. I mean, the first year they did almost nothing on China and they focused in Asia, the focus was on North Korea. So there's two kind of Donald Trumps, you know, when it comes to trade. On the one hand, there is what we call blue collar Trump, Everything I just said, the Chinese are ripping you off. He believes that. I mean, that is part of the, what he thinks about. But then there's also another part of him that is, looks obsessively at the way the stock, market, the stock market operates. As somebody who grew up in Queens I, and whose uh, stepmother knew Donald Trump as a young boy, I look, at, I look at the president as another guy from Queens like I grew up with. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much in that way. And so the easiest way to predict when he would back off on some you know, China offensive would be if the markets were reacting. That was the simplest way. Otherwise, he's, you know, he's very unpredictable. So he ping-pongs between you know, blue-collar Trump and Wall Street Trump, 
and his different aids play on these kind of two, two, two personalities. So people like Navarro or Lighthizer will work on the, you know, when he's in the Wall Street and when he's in the blue collar Trump. And then he has people like Steve Mnuchin who will, you know, yeah, China's a problem. Certainly it's a problem or any NEC director, but there are a lot of problems in the global economy and we can't really let this get out of control. And they play to that side of his personality. And that's, I think, one of the main reasons you'd see U.S. policy ping pong back and forth and back and forth, making it very hard for the Chinese to understand and very hard for people in, you know, in the U.S. to understand as well. Not many folks in the Chinese uh, intelligence services grew up in Queens. Um, <laughs> we, uh, Lynn, you write about how sort of befuddled the Chinese bureaucracy was with Trump and how, you know, they actually, one of their tactics to understand what was going on in the administration was to call up, you know, Steve Wynn and, and Stephen Schwartzman. Trump is a confusing character for sure, but what else do you think made it so difficult for the, the Xi administration to wrap their heads around what was going on in the U.S.? I think there's so much hubris in China these days as well. So it also took a very long time for the Chinese side to realize that the old ways of doing things, the old ways of tying, trying to basically tie your components up in constant, uh, endless dialogues and conversations just not going to work anymore. And even to this day, you talk to Chinese officials, uh, they still like would say something like, yes, we know that you want actions right now, but you know, before we take any actions, we still need to sit down and talk. And the, the Trump administration would respond, I'm done talking. We've been talking for decades now and, and still no solution. You're not taking actions. So I think that's just, you know, that kind of a, a dynamic is still happening today. And, you know, the constantly talk past each other on issues, it just, it's, it's just pretty amazing to watch. You know, I think obviously, yes, the Trump administration, especially during the two years of trade war, was very confusing to the Chinese side. And then especially initially, the Chinese side would complain, oh, I d we didn't know who was in charge, right? Was it Newton? Was it Wilbur Ross? Was it someone else? The funnest story and the part that I was really proud of uh, was, you know, what Bo Bob and I describe in the book, you know, one during Trump's visit to Beijing, both sides, you know, had an economic, you know, meeting, fo just focused on economic issues. So it was a meeting with President Xi Jinping, right? And the, the other side was led by President Trump. And they, the Chinese sides were all expecting the lead economic official on the Trump team would be Wilbur Ross. And instead, it was Lighthizer basically standing up, gave, gave Xi Jinping a lecture about all the things China has done wrong. Where, and where was and where was Rob, Weber Ross? He was outside of the meeting room in the Great Hall of the People waiting to be consulted. That was just uh, like one of the funnest stories we, I think, we got in, in terms of illustrating the Chinese confusion. What the heck, you know? <laughs> So, but later on, later on, I do feel like they knew who was in charge. It was very clear. It was Trump and Lighthizer, right? But they still tried to play that card, like the confusion. Oh, we didn't know what exactly that you want. Of course they know what exactly the, the U.S. side want. There is a list. Yeah, no, I agree with that totally. They they were afraid of Lighthouse. They didn't like Lighthouse, so they tried to go around right. him, you know, and he, it was a mistake the on their doing. part. Because he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he, you know, he studied. He had this plan, agree with it, disagree with it, but he had a plan. But he was a tough guy, you know, and they saw the Treasury Secretary is, you know, more malleable. A treasury Treasury in general has, you know, a view of open markets and keeping you know, the financial markets strong. And they had dealt with, you know, they had dealt with Hank Paulson as the Treasury Secretary. They had never dealt with Tim Geithner, both of whom had deep understanding and experience with China. And they were looking for, you know, his replacement. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, the the I think the model of like uh, New York City liberal Jewish financier is something <laughs> that Chinese senior Chinese officialdom understands pretty well. Yeah. But the, all these new breeds of the Robert Robert Navarros and the Donald Trumps of the world, and even like a Lighthizer type, they haven't had to deal with in a very very long time. Exactly. So. Yeah. No. I mean, Lighthizer even within the trade bar in in Washington. And he was a guy who represented the steel industry, U.S. steel. He got rich representing U.S. steel in dumping actions on steel cases. And one trade person said to me that defending steel companies on dumping is like being the Galapagos when it comes to, you know, the trade bar. You know, it's just out there. It has nothing to do with anything else. Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of folks, they are, you know, excited to negotiate, you know, to, to, to argue things in front of the WTO court and like want to be judges one day, maybe on it. And, and, you know, this guy has really, you have a great line where at some point he gave a congressional testimony in 2012, basically laying out a protectionist trade policy. And he thought of it as his sort of valedictory of like, here's, I'm going to, I'm going to retire into the sunset because there's never going to be a president that's going to want me to implement this sort of, these sort of actions of reviving these, you know, these trade laws from the 1970s and throwing tariffs on Canadian steel and what have you. But he really hit the jackpot with Donald Trump. Yeah, no, no doubt. So going back to the Americans and their adventures in Beijing, great moment, which I can't pass up, which is when Robert Navarro takes Steve Mnuchin out into the courtyard or whatever, he gives you this absolutely outrageous quote where he says where i mean you guys quote him presumably indirectly navarro assumed that they were far enough from any building that the chinese um bugged and let and you know so he's like he's thinking like oh they're not going to catch me doing this and then he screams at mnuchin for 20 minutes i mean i just like i i remember you guys reported this like the day yeah. after right it's just it's just a clown show it's just unbelievable <laughs> I, you guys are probably not going to tell me the answer to this, but the source of that story, like I like there are three potential options, all of which are hysterical. So one is Navarro somehow thinking this would make him sound tough. Two is Mnuchin trying to embarrass Navarro, but is really just incredibly embarrassing for everyone. And three, which would re- re- really be the best is if there was a Chinese, uh, if there was a Chinese official who like, you know, caught wind of this and just like had to share the juicy gossip with with uh with Ling Ling. So I don't know if you guys want to, you know, nod twice uh as to which one it was, but all three are just like are just too too outrageous. Well, I I'll, I'll give you one hint. There were multiple sources on both sides. Put it that way. It, it was yeah. I mean, they were, you know, the Chinese were like, what the fuck's going on? And, you know, and on the American side, actually the same. <laughs> the same response. Yeah, no, I mean, Navarro went after him. You know, there was a buildup here too. Remember that, as I said, that Navarro had been frozen out, and Gary Cohn, who was the at that time the NEC director, National Economic Council director, had tried to freeze him out. Was pretty effective, but also Mnuchin. Mnuchin and Cohn had tried to get him, you know, shipped to the basement, literally to the basement of the Commerce Department, and Steve Bannon, you know, rescued him. So he felt talked down to by Mnuchin. He was talked down to by Mnuchin. It's not just felt. And so, you know, all that, you know, exploded in him. And also he's just a volatile character. He's just, he's got quite a temper and, you know, and felt demeaned. So, but still it was unbelievable. (laughs) So back in the nineties and the negotiation over the WTO, there was this dynamic within the the Chinese government where Jiang Zemin and, and Zhuangzi were trying to use the trade negotiations as a way to force the broader Chinese economy to liberalize and, and as a you know, lever in which to reduce the you know, power influence of the, of the SOEs. The, it seems like the, the Chinese side, particularly Liu He, tried to use this mental model that Americans have of the way Chinese do negotiation sessions to persuade the Americans that, you know, this is what really they were pushing to. At one point, you guys have a quote that Lighthizer had come to trust and re- respect Liu as a committed reformer. Um, you also have an anonymous Chinese source talking about how, quote, the Americans failed to realize just how hard it had been to create a bureaucratic consensus and to get to where we were before they decided to throw it all away. They also said to you guys at one point that the Americans are very, very tough negotiators. Yeah. But I guess my question to you guys is, at what 
at, to what extent does this model really make sense? My reading of the of the situation in the 90s is that the big difference was the fact that the president was down with the program and wanted and 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 was actually it actually saw these saw the trade negotiations as something that should be pursued and and really embraced and was a, and was willing to 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 put the the the, the political capital behind um, uh, Zhu Rongji in order to uh, allow him to to make these these tough concessions. So I'm curious, you know, to to what extent are the uh, Chinese bureaucrats really just playing the Americans here uh, and trying to get off get off a little easier in the trade war when she, in fact, doesn't really have much desire to implement the sorts of reforms which, ironically, may be of uh, more benefit to the Chinese economy than the sort of more statist path that he is currently pursuing? Right. That was a great question. Um, very observing on your part. We definitely try to do a compare and contrast between back in the late 90s uh, when China was trying to negotiate to get into WTO versus the most recent round of negotiations when China was trying to fend off this trade offensive from the trade administration, uh, Trump administration. You're exactly right. Uh, back in the Jiang Zemin, Zhu Rongji era, so that at that time the 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 top agenda, political agenda, was very fixated on continuing the reform and liberalization of the Chinese economy. You know, you, we, we talked about the 99 bombing, U.S. bombing of Chinese embassy earlier. So even in that kind of circumstances, Jiang Zemin famously said that let's not deviate from our core uh, focus yeah. of trying to, you know, liberalize the Chinese economy. So I yeah. remember we talked about the day in, day out, this uh, propaganda attacks on the U.S., but that only lasted for a few weeks. Immediately, the tone changed after Jiang Zemin spoke, you know, yeah. had a, poli- a, poli- a higher level policy meeting. So he yeah. was able to really stick to what he wanted to achieve and give Zhu Rongji the flexibility and the room to do the negotiations. And this time around, it's no longer the case. You know, for, in years past, foreign pressure was good for reforms in China, not anymore under Xi Jinping, because uh, first of all, the leadership changed, and then the, the top agenda also cha- has changed. Today's top agenda for China is this is so-called China dream, right? It really means having a strong, unified China that can compete with the U.S. economically, technologically, and politically. And that also means the country wholeheartedly adheres to this one-party system. So, what? yes, you're right to point out that many things the American side has asked for really is in the long-term interest of the Chinese economy, but not necessarily in the long-term interest of the party. Right. So when those things contradict with each other, you know, you know what the top leadership would would, would choose at the very outside of negotiations. Xi Jinping already drew the lines in terms of things that we can negotiate, uh, negotiate and make concessions to. And there's things that are off limits. Another one of the lines that stuck out at me was, you know, you said that both sides had to worry about critics back home, accusing them of weakness. And it sort of reminds me of this reference. I think it was in a Stephen Kotkin book talking about when Stalin was saying to FDR at Yalta or something that he had domestic constituencies to please to and he couldn't you know, necessarily give in on everything, which I thought which I felt was a little bit maybe overstating the the case on the amount of latitude that she has to go whichever direction he chooses. I mean, that's often the reason Chinese officials would give you to explain why Xi Jinping has removed term limits, why he has consolidated power so much, is because he wanted to do things and then only with more power in his hand could he neutralize the vested interests, you know, the op- opponents in terms of to carry out things he really wanted to, to do. But so far, yes, we have seen c- this consolidation power happening, but we really haven't really yeah. seen reform happening. Yeah, I mean, that narrative you, you just put forward, like, like, really sounds like the backstory to some Marvel supervillain. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but anyways... Anything on this, Bob? 
No, I, I think the only thing I would add on the re- whole reformer sort of thing is I think the U.S. has been searching for another Juron G since 99. And they keep thinking they find one. You know, they keep talking about these Chinese reformer, you know, who will understand that it's the things that the U.S. asked for are actually in China's interest. And, you know, there is, there just isn't anybody like Juron G at this point, right? I mean, who has the you know, the vision in terms of the economic reforms and the political skills to get it through the, the um, bureaucracy and the support of, of the Communist Party leader. I mean, it just isn't anybody like that. Ling Ling, how different would China look today if uh, Li Keqiang was at the top? Well, I maybe not as belligerent, you know, this wolf warrior diplomacy, I mean, it's always there, right? It's always part of the party leadership's playbook when it comes to foreign forces, especially American hegemon. Chairman Mao used it back in the 50s, uh, the 60s, you know, over and over again, especially when China has some domestic issues, they would play this, 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 you know, return to this old playbook. Li Keqiang, you know, he obviously, you know, we, we, we talk about leadership styles, right? Li Keqiang's style, you know, much different from Xi Jinping. People could talk back to him. You know what I mean? The one famous anecdote I heard was during one of the high-level economic uh, meetings, Li Keqiang prized it over. That was in the first term of Xi Jinping. Lo Jiwei, Li Keqiang was uh, talking about certain ways to fix the, the fiscal problems, and Lo Jiwei just cut him off, said, oh, what do you say was wrong? You know, things like that. But yeah. things, things felt, you know, people felt like, you know, they could talk back to him, but but not with Xi Jinping. Right. Yeah. So, so that, he, would, he would never have become a Wei Da Ling Xiao. Uh, right? No, I mean, no. It's just not his style. No, not his style. And uh, you know, uh, the, during the COVID pandemic, right? So you, you you know that Xi Jinping named him actually the head of this one leading group in charge of uh, fighting COVID. And there are so many leading groups in China that Li Keqiang was never had. So when it comes to fighting COVID, he was finally named as head. So uh, it's, it's a kind of thankless job, at least uh, at least in the beginning. So he she sent him to Wuhan, you know, paying a visit to the 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 uh, yeah. free market in Wuhan. And people just really yelled back at him. And when he asked the, the, the ordinary uh, Sit, you know, residents in Wuhan. You know, how are you, how are you guys doing? You know, are you, are you okay? Doing okay? And the one guy just shouted back, "Are we doing okay? Are you kidding me?" It's like, you know, it's like like people. Yes, he's very senior, he's top, but people not as intimidated by him. So just that speaks a little bit about his leadership style. So so you might can you know can speculate if he were the top maybe china wouldn't engage in this so much as you know this eye, eye for eye tip for tat that kind of uh, strategy but it's really hard to say i mean really really hard to say it really depends on what position you're in when you're number 1 sure. you know obviously you might do things differently as when you're number 2 or number 3 yeah it, it, it's funny i i hadn't put two and two together but of course trump at one point, delegated all of this to Mike Pence, which is which is a funny little little parallel about how both leaders thought that they could, you know, pass the blame, and if it didn't go well, it would be the it would be the number two's fault. Last question for you, Ling Ling. Just just in your description of of Li Keqiang, you know, folks always do hypotheticals about what what if the transition would have looked different in 2012, and a different person would have come up based on the kind of personality that 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 Li has has shown over the past few years, you know, if you run, if you run history a hundred times, are there many instances in which, in which she doesn't come out as, as president? That's not guaranteed at all. Back then, I would say the biggest wild card actually was, uh, yeah, you know, he famously said, you know, there cannot be two tigers in a mountain, right? So even if the, the top leaders decided it was Xi's turn to have the country. If Bo, you know, didn't get purged, still return some kind of senior role in the government, you know, he would stir up a lot of problems for him, right? I'm not talking, I can't speculate on outright coup or any sorts, but, but there will be 
a lot more problems that would make she felt very, very insecure. Yeah. And he doesn't have to look over his shoulder at the likes of anyone else on the on the standing committee. Well, for the first two years, he did, right? That explained why the anti-corruption campaign and sure. the military shakeup, right? Because any number of people would take him down because he was so, he, he really didn't have the, that kind of legitimacy Deng Xiaoping or Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao had. So he yeah. had to, if he had to consolidate power, he had to bring down his rivals to secure his position. Bob and Ling Ling, thanks so much for coming on China Talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thank you so much, Jordan. I really had fun. So for this week's outro track, I actually found one of those old folk songs from the PKU grad student turned government official. Chin, 
，来吧，去吧，合肥吧。缓缓的脚步，真实的拥有，流动的青春，来吧，去吧，合肥吧。